Okay, so on Saturday we started into our uh, tour of essential biodiversity variables and we made it through a grand total of one. You remember we talked about genetic composition. We were pretty pessimistic about it maybe, which is to say a lot of people saw very little biodiversity in the existing information resources about uh, genetic composition, at least for African countries. And so that called into the question the idea that genetic composition is an essential biodiversity variable that is feasible, which you remember is one of the qualities that, that were required of, of the EBVs. Um, so today we're going to start talking about a second variable. We're going to talk about species populations. And so what you can imagine if this EBV were very well implemented is that we'd have comprehensive population data for all species worldwide. Okay? And you can imagine learning immense amounts from those data because native, rare, endemic species, indicator species, things like that, if they're increasing, it's good news. If they're decreasing, it's bad news. Um, if you have invasive species, pest species, or species that are indicators of disturbed habitats, well, if they're increasing at a place, it's bad, and if they're decreasing, it's good. So imagine, you know, every 200 kilometers across the surface of the Earth, you can vaguely imagine in some sort of dream having population data for all of the species at that place. It would be wonderful, and we would be able to develop very, very sensitive indicators of conservation status. You know, why wait for a species to transition into endangered or extinct to be able to say, we have a problem here? Much better would be to, to detect those population trends immediately. Now, let's look into some reality. One piece of the puzzle is, what is population data? And if you think about it, population has a couple meanings. One is the existence of a population. So that's essentially distribution. And the other, another meaning is numbers of individuals. Okay? And it turns out this EBV is cast in terms of both of those. So we're going we're gonna to talk about this and see if we can um, sort out some things from it. But first I want you to see the sort of work that's being done. So this is kind of a first um, global scale result that's being based on some sort of population data. So the Red List Index is based on the IUCN Red List of Threatened Species. It's an indicator of the changing state of global biodiversity. It defines the conservation status of major species groups and measures trends in extinction risk over time. By conducting conservation assessments at regular intervals, changes in the threat status of species in a taxonomic group can be used to monitor trends in extinction risk. Red list indices have been calculated for birds and amphibians using changes in, changes in threat status for species in each of the groups. Okay, so this is, this is I want to show you kind of two major efforts that have, that have developed population-based evaluations at global scales. And so you see these, these many publications, biodiversity indicators based on trends in conservation status, measuring global trends in the status of biodiversity. Um, and so this is something that there are people who are really serious about developing. And essentially what they're doing is they're using the IUCN threat categories. Obviously over here we have extinct, so forget about that. 
right? Uh, extinct in the wild, critically endangered, endangered, vulnerable, near threatened, and least concern. Okay? So essentially, what the red list index does is forget about numbers, forget about populations in the sense of, of places on the map where the species is present. This is just overall, for a given species, did it stay in the same category? Let's say there's an evaluation in 1990 and in 2020. So in that 30-year period, does it stay as vulnerable or does it transition down to near threatened or does it transition up to endangered? Okay, and just as I said earlier, if we have things going that direction, it's generally bad news. And we have th things going this direction, it's generally good news. That makes sense to everybody? Yes. Okay. So, so most of you are, are familiar with the IUCN red lists and endangerment. These are the criteria that we use for these different threat categories, critically endangered, endangered and vulnerable. And the, I'm not going to go through this. This is, this is, in some senses, lateral to what we're talking about. But you can see the major criteria are reduction in population size under various criteria, small range, small and declining population, very small population, very small range, and a quantitative analysis. So you could have, in some cases, you would have um, very detailed population data, and those population data might indicate that the species is not replacing itself. Okay? And so even though it's, it's you know, not meeting these criteria, if you do a, they're usually called population viability analysis. If you do that analysis and have essentially quantitative information that suggests that the species is going to be gone within some number of generations, then you can qualify the species for one of these categories. And so there are, there are algorithms and there are questionnaires that essentially spit out these, these status um, categorizations for species. But notice that this has to be done for groups where the species have been described. Right? You have to know what they are. And in, in birds, for example, we add maybe 10 new species worldwide to the list per year, but never more than 10. So we're not changing very much, you know, a one-tenth of one percent maximum. Um, you can do it for mammals, maybe butterflies, some groups of plants, maybe reptiles and amphibians, and then you pretty much run out of gas. Okay, these, these criteria and these evaluations really can be done on a, on a group-wide basis only for very few taxa. Yeah. The last column, the right. Yes. Over 10 year generation in the past forever. Can you help to extend <laughs> that? So, so essentially what those, you know, qualifiers is the main point. So, you know, if we see a 90% reduction in population size over either 10 years or three generations, then we can call it critically endangered. If it's a decline of 70%, we call it endangered. If it's 50%, we call it vulnerable. Um, but then it adds these qualifiers or where causes are reversible, like where you could possibly change it, where they are understood, you know what did it, and have stopped. So it's a historical reduction in population size. But then look at A2 through A4, and that is 
uh, in past, future, or combination of past and future. And it could be a continuing decline, it could be severe fragmentation, or it could be extreme fluctuation. So again, they're just, they're just giving us a lot of um, qualifiers, okay? So again, this is the, there are whole courses taught on this topic of, you know, how do you uh, categorize species for red list? And then you can see numbers of species in each red list category as published in Color and Andrew Color 94, BirdLife International, and the number of species undergoing genuine status changes. So this is for birds, okay? And there's a whole um, entity called BirdLife International that worries about status decisions. Uh, but you can see you know, the number of species extinct in 1988, 94, and 128, uh, sorry, and 2000. And what you can see is actually the number hits a maximum in 1990 and then comes down by one or two. How does a species become non-extinct? Anybody know? No, not Jurassic Park. <laughs> Hold on, Jesse. Uh, for me, I think for a species to become an extinct is new data. It has been spotted somewhere else and... Uh -huh. yeah. Okay, that's one possibility, yeah. Species are rediscovered decades after they were thought to be gone. And the other reason is sometimes taxonomic changes lead us to realize, oh, that thing that we thought was a species that we thought was extinct is, well, or actually was, not really a distinct species. Mm -hmm. So th those are two reasons why that number can come down. So essentially, what the Red List Index is doing is working off of these numbers. So forget about extinct, let's look at uh, vulnerable. It's a new category in 1994, and you can see the numbers come down. But endangered, you can see the numbers go up by more than 50%. Okay? So there are a bunch of things going on here. The people doing this have to be really, really, really careful that they're using the same ruler, you know, the same measurement from decade to decade when they do these status evaluations. Okay, because if they basically come to appreciate that, that endangerment is more um, sensitive or less sensitive, they can then create trends that don't really exist. Um, so the, the red list index is this summary of how many species are going towards extinction, which was the left on my diagram, and how many are going towards full recovery, which is to the right. And so they, they build an index, 100% would be getting better uniformly, and they essentially scale that to, to what was going on in 1988, which was the first conservation status assessment globally for, for birds, I think. Um, and you can see it coming down. Okay, now, what does it mean that globally the red list index is coming down? It means that more species are in the more serious threat categories and fewer species are in the less threat categories. But I want you guys to think deeper. This is this is what big global conservation NGOs do. There's the red list index. The world's going to hell. Did we learn anything? Did we not know that natural habitats globally are being fragmented? 
Does this tell us whether any species went extinct, and if so, how many, or where? It may be that East Africa is getting better markedly, and Indonesia is, is in ruins. Or it may be that worldwide, everything's getting just a little bit worse. So one thing that's very, very worrisome about these assessments is that the geographic resolution, the spatial resolution that you get out of them, is no finer than the ranges of the species, right? Because one species, these are species-wide evaluations, one species is either vulnerable or endangered. And it counts as having transitioned from vulnerable to endangered across its whole range. Right? So you can't get a finer spatial resolution with red list indices. You can't get an, a resolution that's finer than the range of the species. But think about lions. Okay, lions in Botswana are doing pretty well, right? Lions in Kenya are doing okay. And lions in Benin are in really bad shape, right? In fact, all of those West African lion populations are in really bad shape. This only sees lion as a species. Okay, it doesn't see that this third of the range may be in really bad shape, or this part of the range may be in really good shape. So, uh, this, is, this is not worth going terribly into, but they tried to kind of calibrate their, their red list index. Um, what if no species had changed category, which is this? And what if 10% or 50% of the species in the categories from near threatened to critical had been uplisted one category? And so you see, here's the 10% and here's the 50%. And what you see is that the bird species red list is right on for 10%. Okay, so they're kind of trying to give us an idea of how bad is this news. It's equivalent to 10% of the bird species on Earth shifting one category down. Now, red list indices for birds in different biogeographic realms. So Neotropics, Afrotropics, Australasian, Oceanic, Palearctic, Nearctic, and Indo-Malaysian region. And what you can see is, you know, Indo-Malaysian region is particularly bad off, and the Neotropics are particularly better. But bear in mind, this is based on whole species ranges. And not a lot of species are distributed across multiple realms, but they can't see much finer than this. So I, I need to know how many times the experts came together to review the state of species. Ah, good question. And which strategy they, did they use to collect the data of all the other. Very, very good, very, very good pair of questions. How often do the experts get together? And what strategies, what, what tools do they use? So as you could see from the dates that I was giving you, it's about once a decade. That's for birds. But species are being reevaluated continuously. But to do a global list, you really have to kind of harmonize all those different decisions. And so it's been about once a decade. Um, what strategies do they use? It varies. Um, in some cases, they have real population data. You know, think about lions. You know, you could look at population trends in lion populations all across their range. But for some obscured bird species that has, you know, a tiny range and it's only found on the, you know, the west shores of Lake Tanganyika, you don't know much. You know, you ask, 
how many records are there, how many places are there where we get records, and there's not much more than that. Maybe you can look at satellite imagery from it within its range. You can see whether all the forest is being cut or it's, it's reasonably stable. Um, and in the worst cases, it's based on expert opinion. Okay, and that, that I think is, is dangerous. Okay? Yes. Is this index applicable to plants as well, or it's just... So, that's an interesting comment. Um, is the index, is the red list index applicable to plants? It could be applied to any taxon, plant, animal, whatever, so long as you have repeat global conservation status assessments. Now, doing a global conservation status assessment for plants would be a monumental undertaking. You know, birds, we have 12,000 species. Plants, how many species? Okay? And, and the number of plant species that are extraordinarily poorly known is very, very high. Okay? So, I guess I should make a, a comment, which is, you know, you guys are perceiving the literature. I mean, I just showed you um, three reprints of these red list indices. It's very, very important that you develop the ability, and some of, you know, we've seen this, this level of thinking, but, you know, in this group, you guys have been really good, but it's really important to be able to look at something critically and to be able to say, this says that X, Y, and Z. Because it's published, should I believe it? Yeah. It's only if it's published and the methods and the results and the discussion convince you, okay? So I really want to see people, not just here, but worldwide, look at the scientific literature critically and be able to say, well, the input data are weak. So should I believe the output? You know, and it's only if you believe the whole chain of input data and protocols and, and, and such that you should believe the output. Okay, so it's very, very important to look at these things critically. I'm presenting red list indices to you guys as neutrally as I can. I hate them, okay? Excuse me, but they're bullshit, they're biased, and they are also spatially completely unresolved. You get to say, oh, Africa's going to hell. <laughs> well, <laughs> Africa's a big place, as you guys well know, right? And there may be parts of Africa that are improving and parts of Africa that are declining, and you need that spatial resolution to be able to say, no, you know, Ghana's doing a great job right now, but, you know, Malawi is in big trouble because there's a whatever, and I'm making it up. But this, this index and this body of work, to me, has major failings based on my perception of the inputs, the protocols, the analyses, and the interpretations. Yeah. But I'm trying to present this and the next one to you objectively. Okay. And I want to see you guys think about it critically. Jesse. There's one species that was, it is called Aloe trucanensis. Eh? It's one of the Aloe vera variants. It was listed as endangered. And for me, I was thinking the criteria used to list it as endangered was more of business related. After this, mm -hmm. this demand for a particular product is when people were working backwards to, to try and critically look at the plant. But then the areas that they were, if you say the areas that they're saying it is endangered, if you walk in those areas, it is abundant in, the, in, in natural populations. Mm -hmm. So we are essentially employing a practice of saying, oh, the communities do not touch this thing, it is endangered. But then the community is telling you, have you seen sure. Sure. What is behind these hills? I mean, in some senses it makes sense in that you can have, you know, a nice broad range and a species that's a generalist mm -hmm. 
and you know, just kind of things that would make you very relaxed about the species conservation status. But if each individual plant is worth you know, 100 US dollars, then they could disappear very quickly. And you have a wonderful example of that, African gray parrot. Big range, 